Hey, it's good to see you guys at Cultivate. We do have guests with us. We just want you to know we are glad you're hanging out with us at Cultivate today. Welcome to all of you watching by the internet. Hey, we are in week three of a series that we're calling For the Love. And uh, all month long we have been talking about that subject, that topic of love. And uh, really how culture throws the word love around, how we really paste that love on anything. We describe everything as something we love. I had hibachi last night. Come on, hibachi, they feed you a lot. You ever been there? A dinner and a show, and they give you a lot. I loved it. I loved every second of it. I loved the show. I loved the food. But, you know, the truth is I'm not going to sacrifice for it. It was something I enjoyed. It was yesterday. It's gone. It's not helping me any today. But at the moment, I loved it. And that's what we say about love. We have watered down this, uh, this word of love. We've attached it to emotions, and we've attached it to feelings. And feelings fade, emotions fade. They change day by day. That's why love seems to change day by day. I love you today. I don't like you tomorrow. You know, we've got that, that feeling and this culture of love in 2016. But all month, we've really been taking a look at it from a biblical lens and what the Bible says about love and what God says about it. And in week one, Pastor Brandon, and kicked us off talking about God's love for us. Because the truth is, you can't receive love or give love until you understand that the true source of it comes from God. So anything that I obtain in myself, any love that I try to give, is really only coming from a sinful, selfish place. It really takes the love of God in me to be able to share it or even experience it. And then last week we talked about some relationship love, whether that be your marital relationships or dating or your family members, your co-workers. We just talked about what it looks like to be able to have relationships in a biblical perspective. And today I entitled your message, I want you to grab your outline out of your worship guide, I uh, entitled your message, Love Goes, because I want to talk to us about taking the love that we've been given and sharing it and giving it away. That the greatest thing that we've ever been gifted is the love of God, and so many of us are guilty of just keeping it for ourselves, focusing life on me. But true life on purpose really is focusing it on everyone else. As a matter of fact, we've been looking at 1 Corinthians 13 and 13 on the top of your outline. And we've used this all month long as our key verse of Scripture. And it says this, Three things will last forever, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. It's the greatest thing that we've ever been given. So why is it that the greatest gift that I've received why do we not share it more than we do? And this really hits every one of us at home. And I just want to challenge us today. Today's message is really a, a, a message that should challenge our hearts. And it should really challenge our motives with God and what we do with what God has given to us. How much of God's love are we sharing? How much of it are we giving away? And you know, in 2016, it's easier to share something than has ever been before. Think about it. You share all kind of crazy things on Facebook. You may not know this, but I have like nicknames for some of you. Like some of you, you're the cat, you're the cat lady because you share all the cat stuff. You know what I'm talking about? All the cat videos. Some of you share all the dog videos and all the dog posts. Some of you are chefs. You share all the food stuff. Daniel Jeffries in our church, he's cooking something. Everything he posts is some sort of food that he has put together. It's amazing. So I just always know that I'm going to get some food from Daniel on Facebook. Nancy Koshat in our church. I'm not sure if Nancy's in here this morning, but Nancy will post. You need to follow Nancy on Facebook. She has the craziest post of anybody that I've ever seen. If you want to see it, just follow Nancy. It's easy to share our lives. Some of you share your kids. All of your kids, everything, your kids, you love your kids, and we see them all the time. You know, we see all types of things on Facebook. And even one of my favorites a couple of weeks ago was there was a lady riding in the car with her poodle. It was like a big, giant poodle. Maybe you saw this. And this poodle insisted that she hold its hand the whole time that she's in the car. Yes, the poodle insisted that the driver hold her hand. The, the poodle was in the passenger seat as big as a person sitting in this car. And the poodle would take its paw and place it over there and just paw at the driver until she would hold its paw and then she would stop. And if the driver would let it go, the poodle would reach right back across and start pawing again. To hold. I mean, come on, somebody. You don't even hold your spouse's hand in the car, but that poodle was like, hold my hand. We share everything in the world because we enjoy it. We see something, we like it, we think, man, I want to share this with someone else. I'm an undercover Facebook sharer. I'll send it to you in a private message. You know, I, see some, I tell my wife all the time, I'm 
sharing all kind of dog videos, and, but I just send it to her in a message or record it on my phone. I don't want to be that guy, you know, on Facebook sharing all the dog stuff. But we share it because we enjoy it. We share it because we like it, because we think it's funny. It made us laugh. It brought joy to us. It's something we thought was important. It's something you wanted to send to your family. It's so easy to share. But when it comes to our faith, the truth is we all become silent. It's like the best secret that we've ever known, but we keep it silent. We don't share it. And there's lots of reasons for it. Maybe we're, maybe we're scared to share. Maybe we're embarrassed. Maybe we're ashamed. Maybe we don't want anybody to know that we were at church today and, and that we kind of do that thing. Or maybe it is that somebody's going to ask you a question and you're afraid you're not going to know the answer. Maybe you don't think you know the Bible good enough. There's all kinds of reasons why we don't share. But this morning, I want to help us shift our lens to why it is so important that we give away the greatest gift that we've ever been given. Because when you begin to shift your focus and see the world as Jesus sees it, you begin to see people in need. That every day when we walk around, every person that we interact with, every smiling face that you see, there is a story behind that smile. There is a circumstance that they're carrying. Every one of us in this room, we walked in here today, and we are loving God, and we are celebrating, and we are enjoying each, one, each other's companies. But you brought some baggage, and you brought some hurts, you brought some pains, you brought some worries in this room with you today. And the Lord sees all of that. But I want us to change our focus to where we can see the need that eternity matters and it weighs in the balance with people. I was in, of all places, I was in, in the veterinarian's office several months back. And I'd carried my dog in there, and we were sitting in the little waiting room, you know, and this lady comes in with this kind of mixed-breed dog. It was a real pretty dog. It was a big dog, and, and she had this dog just by the collar, and she was pulling it, and that dog was resisting. That neck was stretched out. Man, she was just, she didn't pick it up. She didn't push it. I mean, she was pulling until that dog was going to come with her. And so I kind of watched, and she sat down, and the dog was just being a dog. It was wanting to sniff other dogs, and it was kind of barking. And every time it would even move, she would yell at it and, and just kind of slide it back under the table. And she was being really rough with this dog, and I was kind of getting a little uncomfortable. I'll be honest. I sat there, and I said, man, how long do I need to sit here before I make a scene in this veterinarian's office? Like, what am I going to do here? So then they call from the counter. They call her name, and they said, what are you in for? And she says, I'm here to, to put a dog down. And I said, oh, my gosh, you're about to kill this dog. Like, they're going to put it down. It's like, what am I going to do? And in my mind, my heart starts racing. I'm thinking, how am I going to save this dog? Like, I'm about to rescue this animal. I said, I said, man, can I get this dog in my car? It's a big dog. And then I thought, will it get along with my dog if I put them in the car with me and I have to ride home with it? You know, a strange dog. What's going to happen? And then I'm thinking, I'm not putting this dog in my house. And so can I let it in the backyard? Will it live back there? And then I happen to think, how much is it going to cost to feed this dog? It's a big dog. And then I happen to think, what's my wife? wife going to say? And that's where I kind of stop right there. And you know, what's my wife going to say when I show up with this big dog? And so my mind is just racing about what am I going to do about this dog? And all I could think about was this poor animal has no idea that it's sitting at the end of its life. In just a few moments, it's over. And so I just began talking to this girl about this dog and she began to share that it was getting old in age and that it was getting aggressive. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, I don't know. And I just kind of backed up, and I just said, well, God, I'll let you take care of this. I don't know. Let this dog go to heaven. Lord Jesus, bless it. Whatever you got to do. Some <laughs> salvation come that dog's way. I didn't know what to say. But suddenly, over since that, just that silly experience, I felt like the Lord convicted me because he said, Brandon, as you sat there, you saw an immediate need of a life that was in danger. And every day, people that live, this is just the truth, church. It's not something to scare us. It's not something that's just church talk. Every day that we live, our lives weigh in the balance of eternity, of a heaven and of a hell. And the only way to spend it with Jesus is through the power and the love and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, the life. There is no other way besides Jesus. And I know that. And there's somebody that Jesus is going to put in my path this week that does not have that knowledge, and I have the ability to be the difference maker in their eternity. So this morning, I just want us to shift our lens, and I'm praying specifically that God just begins to put this burning desire in our heart, that he just convicts us that today we have a responsibility. Those of us who, who carry the name of Christ and we claim to be believers we carry the responsibility of Jesus. So I want us to pray, and I just want you to open up your heart today to say, God, 
If you need to convict me, if you need to change me, God, I'm just asking that you speak to me today. So can we do that? Father, we love you. God, we're so thankful for your presence here today. And God, I just pray that over these next few moments that we spend time in your word, God, that you do, you convict us. God, it's your Holy Spirit that begins to bring truth to our lives. And Father, I want to be a person that makes a difference. God, not just corporately on a Sunday morning or not just inside of my comfort zone, but God, I want to be a difference maker that is someone who brings the truth of your love to people that don't know. So God, we're asking that today we just begin to be convicted to move and to speak and to give and to serve lives who are around us so that people can be introduced to a life of greatness, a life of fullness, the life of abundance that you tell us about. And we know that that's found in you, Jesus. So God, today, just just begin to convict our hearts as we go into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want you to grab your outline, and I want to give you a couple things this morning that I want to get very practical with the message today because sometimes we think about uh, giving Jesus away and we can get real churchy with it and we can get all these strategies and we can do all of this stuff, which is good, but I just want to get practical this morning and I want to talk to us like right where we are, that when we leave this place today, we're going to find ourselves in circumstances where we can be the hands and the feet and the mouth of Jesus. So let me give you a couple of areas that I'm saying these are our sphere of influence. This is the sphere of influence that's in all of our lives. These are the the things that we reach and the people that we see every single day. So number one, write this down. Here's your first sphere of influence is my people. My people. Some of you didn't know you had people, but you got your own people. Have my people call your your people. You know what I'm talking about? We'll get it it worked out. Every person in this room, you've got your people. You've got those who that you hang around, that you spend most of your time with, that you work with, they're your family. It's the people that you see practically on a daily basis and that you spend the a biggest part of your time with. That's the people that you have the greatest impact on because that's where your influence is. And then Bi- the Bible says in Acts 16 and 31, a couple of examples of, of people that are having an encounter with Jesus, and this is their response. The Bible says they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. Now this is a moment in scripture where where people are being introduced to Jesus and as they are personally being introduced to Jesus, as the life change is taking place in them, they didn't say that this is just for you. Notice the emphasis was not just on them. That in the moment, even though they were giving their heart to the Lord, that their life was being changed, they're saying, hey, but this isn't just for you. Not only will your life be changed, not only will you be saved, but this is also going to affect your entire household. Why would he say that it's going to not only affect you, but it's going to affect your household? Because you can't have a change in your life and it not spill over to someone else. That if your life is different, every person that is in relationship with you should notice a life change that has taken place in your life. It's impossible to live and move and breathe in Jesus and people not see that something is different about us. The sphere of influence begins with the people who are the closest to us. And then another story in Mark chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Jesus says this, he says, Go home to your family. This is another man who has just received a healing, a miracle in his body. And Jesus speaks to him and says, Go home to your family. Tell them that... Everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit the ten towns of that region and began to proclaim the great things that Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told them. So you've got a man who just had a miracle in his body, who just experienced Jesus in a miraculous way. And this guy says, hey, listen, sign me up. Wherever you're going, I'm going with you. Whatever you need me to do, I'll do it. I'll carry your bags. I'll tote your stuff. I'll I'll prepare it. Whatever you need, Jesus, I'm here. I am yours. I am going with you. You have my life. And Jesus said, that's not what I need you to do. That would be great for you to come hang out with me. It'd be great for you to enjoy the benefits of just my company. You would experience some really cool things to get to go and to be a part of the disciples, and we could go and do this together. But it's more important, it's more valuable if you go back to your home and you share it with your family. Why? 
Because that's your sphere of influence. Because not everyone has the influence that this man has. So Jesus said, you go back to your people and you begin to tell them what I have done for you. So I love what this guy does. The Bible says he goes back and he goes to ten different towns. He don't just go back into his house. He goes everywhere. He starts his own like traveling ministry. I'm going to be in this town tonight. Anybody that will listen and then we're going to go to this town over here. I mean this guy just got serious about it. Why? Because God had done something in his life and he had something to share. And when you've got something to share, you can't be quiet. People ask Dawson and I a lot. You know, over the years, they've asked, you know, I said, how did how'd you guys become pastors? Like, how did you, you know, you guys are young. How did you begin doing this? And we said, you know what? We just did it. We didn't, we didn't know that we couldn't. No one had ever told us that, that you had to do anything different than just to do it. When God changed our lives, we just started doing anything, anywhere, so anyone would listen. We got a tent one time, set it up on the side of the road. We said, it said about 200 people. And we just started telling people, we're going to have church on the side of the road under this tent at a four-lane intersection. And if you want to come, just show up. We're going to be there every night at 7 o'clock. And would you guys believe, as crazy as it is, people showed up. Like, I don't know if I'd have showed up, but people, people showed up. People came to this thing. I'd have been like, who are these weirdos? What are they talking about? An attempt on the side of the road. Listen, it came a thunderstorm one night. It was raining. It was lightning. The mud was, was rushing under our feet because of all the water. I thought, oh, man, people's go what's going to happen tonight? What do we do? And everybody just sat in their seats. I said, well, we'll just give them Jesus. That's all we know to do. We're teenagers. This is a true story. We are teenagers. There was a homeless man that lived across the road in the intersection where we set this tent up who lived under the bridge, and every night, he would come out from under that bridge and he would stand on the outside of that tent and he would stand and listen about the good news of Jesus because we would tell him that Jesus loves you and wants to change your life. Listen, when Jesus has given you a story, you just need to share it. Anybody who will listen, that's your audience. Anywhere you are, that's your ministry. Anything God has given to you, the people, that is your ministry. Just begin to use it. This guy goes everywhere. It just begins to share it anywhere people would listen. Do you know that they say every person on an average, that every individual has about 12 people that is in direct relationship with you that is your greatest sphere of influence? These are people that you spend your most amount of time with. In other words, if you spend about an hour a day, quality time with about 12 people, that's your greatest sphere of influence. Think about it. The people that you work with every day, you spend more time with those people than you do your own family. They say on average a father spends about seven minutes a day of quality time with his children. And you think about it, you think, oh, that can't be true. But you think quality time. You pick them up, you take them to the games, you bring them home, you feed them, you do homework, you put them in the bed, and the day's gone. And you start and you do that all day tomorrow. But the people that you work with, that you're sitting beside, or that you're on the job site with, you are with those people at least eight, nine, ten hours every single day. Think about the people right now that's in your life that fits this greatest sphere of influence. It's your family, it's your work, it's your hobbies, the places you are, the people that you spend your time with. And you know, they say that as far as church people go, all of us who attend church every week, and we love God, and we serve Him with our time. Do you know that statistics say that only 2% of us will invite somebody to church? So out of this room, only 2% of us are going to invite someone to church. It's a national statistic. But do you know the reversal of that is? It says that 80% of people who are invited, people who were polled that don't attend church, 80% of those people said, if someone would invite me, I would go. We have a sphere of influence, but we're just taking the greatest gift ever, and we're holding it into ourselves. And you know, I was thinking about this just last week. Just last week at Cultivate Church, the people who were represented in this room and where they came from. In 2015, listen to this, the church had a 25% increase in growth in one year, last year. 25% more people began calling Cultivate home because people were invited. And think about this, last week alone, there were people here from Gardendale, Alabama, Aniana. Aniana's over an hour away. Columbiana, Pinson, Hoover, Helena, Chelsea, Calera, Montevallo, Rimlap, Alabaster, Clanton, and Pelham. 
Just a few places that I spoke to people last week that people came from. Vandiver, one I didn't put on, there was somebody here from Vandiver. People from all over at Cultivate. And I'm thinking, my gosh, there are some good churches between here and there. Like, you just, you maybe just drive a little slower. Maybe you missed them. You're driving a long way. <laughs> Don't drive that far. But listen, when you experience Jesus, you'll go to wherever you have to get to to get to Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? People are desperate and they don't, you don't even know it. We're so busy with our lives and we're so surface level that people are desperate for life and life change and they don't even know what it is and it's Jesus. You have the answer and I have the answer. They will drive, they'll get up early, they'll get in your car, they'll do whatever they have to do if they're impacted by the power of God. And I'm just crazy enough to believe, church, that Jesus can do it. I'm just crazy enough to believe that Jesus is the answer. And if we will give them Jesus, their lives will be changed. Number two, write this one down. My place. It's another sphere of influence. My place. One of my favorite verses, Acts 17, says this. From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And listen to this. He marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. It is no accident that we live in 2016. It is no accident that God has put us on the planet with the greatest technology in all the world. That we don't have to get on a boat, that we don't have to get in a plane to reach the entire world. You can reach the entire world from your social media life without crossing the border or crossing the ocean. We live in an incredible time. Imagine if Jesus had have had this technology back in the day. All that they did to spread the gospel with no technology, imagine what they would have done if they had these resources. And they're looking at us like, come on, guys, step it up. A few less puppy videos and a little more me. Come on. Something. Let the word out. Let people know that you're a believer. Tell them you went to church today. Just get on Facebook and write it and say, hey, I'm going to church. Does anybody want to come? Listen to what God did for me today. Listen to what God can do for you. You don't even have to see them face to face anymore. Jesus is saying, use what we have. It's no accident that we have a sphere of influence in the place that we are. Your work environment, your family. Some of you want to trade your family so bad you can't get them to leave. But they're yours. They belong to you. And it's no accident that they belong to you. Some of you want to quit that job so bad, you're begging God for a new one, and God's saying, until you do what I've called you to do, where you are, I'm not going to promote you until you uh, uh, finish the assignment that I've given to you. Because he's called us to a place, and it's not on, pur uh, not on accident, it's always on purpose. Listen to this, I, I, I got a notification this past week. I don't know my neighbors in my neighborhood. We've lived in our neighborhood about a, almost a year. And my neighbors don't speak. I'm that weird guy that, that kind of stands out and just kind of hoping to catch a conversation. We're like, the neighbors. <laughs> I'll be out in the yard cutting grass, and it's like I'm, just, I'm cutting grass this way because I'm waving at everybody that passes by. And, you know, I don't understand if they don't see me. I know I'm not the tallest, but come on, I'm in the yard cutting grass. <laughs> Slow down enough to wave at me when you go by. You hurt my feelings. If you live in my neighborhood, come on. Bring me a pie. Welcome me to the neighborhood. Something. <laughs> What happened to neighborly love? I don't know a soul in my neighborhood except for the people that live across the street, incredible people. And then I get a Facebook notification that says my neighborhood is having a neighborhood meeting. I said, you're going to talk to me on Facebook, but you can't wave at me when you pass my house. And I thought to myself, I'm just going to be real honest with you. I said, well, why would I want to go to your house and meet you when you won't even wave when I'm standing outside? Something's wrong with this. So I'm just kind of like, well, I'm not going to do that. And then I just felt like the Lord speak to me and said, why do you live in this neighborhood? Of all the neighborhoods, of all the places, why do you live right here? And I just, God, I don't know. It's just where I am. It's just where we ended up. <laughs> but, you know, the Bible says that he knew what my address would be long before I moved into this house. He already knew I was going to live in that house. 
He already knew who my neighbors were going to be, and he knows every need that's represented in my neighborhood, and he knows that if I will get over myself and I will get out and meet some people and build some relationships and show up, maybe, just maybe, I'll have an opportunity where I am, where I've been placed to share the love of Jesus. I don't have to stand in that meeting and have to preach. I don't have to tell people I'm a pastor. I just have to show up and smile and be nice to people and just show Jesus through who I am. Wherever you are, that's your mission field. You have a place that God has given you. Steward it well. And number three is we have a passion. It's my passion. Every one of us, we have a passion in this room. There's something you enjoy. You enjoy sports, or you enjoy outdoors, or you enjoy crafts, or you enjoy cooking, or whatever it is, we've been given a passion. And God intends us to use those passions to connect with people. That's what this thing's all about. Everything is about people. And whatever avenue that we have to connect with people, God wants us to use it. The Bible says, Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things He's planned for us long ago. Listen, if our ultimate passion is Jesus... Jesus will be present in everything that we do. Think about this. We can get so wrapped up in whatever our passions are, we can get wrapped up in this hobby, in this thing, in this enjoyment, and that can overtake our life. But if Jesus is the thing that we're the most passionate about, above all, he will be present in every other thing that we do. Pastor Brandon and Danielle, their little girl Isabella, is starting to play soccer. And uh, what's funny is she didn't know a thing about soccer. And so I was talking to her this morning. I said, hey, how you doing with soccer? I said, is it going good? She said, well, my coach told me twice I was doing pretty good. I said, all right, I guess you're doing it. She's counting. He told me twice that I'm doing good. So I guess you're doing all right. And when Pastor Brandon started, started telling me about the soccer, he said, you know, we got practices on, on Mondays and Thursdays and Saturdays. And I was like, I was feeling for him. I said, oh, man, I'm so sorry. Like he just got a bad doctor's report. I said, man, I, I'm so sorry that you got to show up all those days of the week. Isn't that awful? And he said, no, that's not bad. And I'm thinking, man, listen, all we have to do, is just kick it a little too hard, let her hands miss it right on the chin. She'll be okay, but she may not want to play anymore. We can get you out of this. Like, we can rescue you if you want out of this thing. I'm just telling you, if you need help, I've, I've got a book on parenting, okay? <laughs> Those of you that don't know me, I don't have kids, but I can tell you I got some ideas of what you could do. So. But I said, I can get you out of this. And this is what he said. He said, you know, he said, I thought about it. He said, and I'm going to be at the ballpark or you know, the soccer field. I'm going to be there a lot. He said, I'm going to meet a lot of other parents. And he said, he said, it's just a chance for me just to connect with people. I'm going to be there, and I'm going to get to meet people. And a light bulb just went off in my head, and I remembered years ago, and he and I worked on staff together at a church, and, and the church just began sort of organically as people started coming into the church, and then they would give their heart to God, and they would show up next, peak, next week with like a, like a minivan full of people. And it's like, where did these people come from? And they were just bringing them from the ballpark. They would go to the ballpark, invite everybody they knew. These people would show up. Their life would be changed. They would go back to the ballpark, and they would just bring people in week by week. I mean, it was amazing that everywhere you went, every person you talked to, they just said, they just told me about it at the ballpark. I just had to come check it out. But it's the place that we are. It's the passion that you have. And all I'm saying is, if we think through the lens that Jesus has placed us here with a great responsibility to give the greatest thing away, the love of God, to people that may not have it, let's use the opportunities that we have. So I want you to flip your outline over, and I want to give you just three practical ways. Because I know what you're saying. I mean, I understand we've got influence in our life, but the truth is, I'm not prepared to you know, witness to anybody. I'm not prepared to, to make that statement yet. I don't know what to say. If they ask questions, I, I don't know what to answer. I don't know where to tell them to go in the Bible. I'm just not ready for that yet. But I just want to make it real easy, and I want to give you three ways that I think we can get this thing right. And number one, this is for all of us, and this is where we begin. This is the core of it, is that we have the right manner. We have the right manner in our life. Scripture says, Make it your goal to live a quiet life. This is a good one. Minding your own business and working with your hands. 
just as you've been instructed before. Some of you may want to memorize that one and use it this week. Listen, I think the best thing you could do is learn to live a quiet life and mind your own business. That's what the Bible says. So you can use that this week if you want to use that. But in verse 12 it says, Then, here's the result of that life. Then people who are not believers, and I underline that because that's the goal. People who are not believers is the goal. That's why we open these doors every week. That's why we do what we do, because for people who are not believers, they will respect the way that you live, and you will not need to depend on others. So the greatest way that you can be the hands and feet of Jesus is you can live it out in front of people. There should be something different about my life. I should live different. I should talk different. I should treat people different. I should serve different. I should give different. I should look different. Everything about my life, someone should look at me that doesn't have a relationship with God and go, what is it about that person that's different? And not because it's me, because just me is just a sinful mess. But the Jesus who has changed me and lives in me and works through me, that's what people should begin to see. Just start with the life that you live. Just be authentic. If you're going to serve God, serve God. If you're going to give everything you've got to Him, give Him everything you've got. Doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. Doesn't mean you're not going to mess up. Doesn't mean you don't need somebody to help you through the tough times of life. But it means with everything that's in you, He is the goal that less of me and more of Him so that my life shines out to people that don't know that God loves them. I started following this athlete online because I've, I've just heard a lot about this particular person. And I heard about stories of them going to hospitals and spending all their off time like with sick children. And that they would go into nursing homes and, and, and minister to the elderly. And, and then one thing that really piqued my interest the most is I'm hearing all these stories about this guy. In New York City, he went and took a whole group, about 12 homeless people, and took them to the nicest, swankiest restaurant that you could possibly go to. Like you had to dress a certain way, you had to know the right people to be able to get in, and he gets all of these homeless people together just as they are, takes them inside of this well-to-do place where it's all about me, and sits them at the table and buys all of them dinner. And I said, man, what is this guy's deal? Something is different. And I started following him on Instagram and realized that every post that he posts has scripture under the bottom. And he said just this week, he said, I am blessed to be a blessing. And the greatest thing that I can do is to give my life away. And it's, it just went off. I said, I knew it. He's a believer. He had to be a believer. To be this guy doing what he's doing, I knew he had to be a believer. And he was. There's something different, and it points to something that's not me. It's not natural. It's not culture. It's just Jesus. And I want my life to point to Jesus. So let's have the right manner in our lives. Listen to this. You'll never influence the world trying to be like it. You'll never influence this world trying to be like this world. Let's be different. Number two is the right moment. If you have the right manner, God will always give you the right moment. The Bible says, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Make the most of every opportunity. Every day there's an opportunity. We just may not see it. Because I'm so absorbed in my day, my circumstance, my situation, my stuff. But there's an opportunity every day that we live. And as a church, I want to encourage us because Corporately, we are on the brink of the greatest opportunity that we could be on in a year, and it's the Easter season. You know, people will go to church on Easter when they won't go to church any other time. I mean, we just, we're going to go to church on Easter. We live in the South, and that's a benefit for us in, in Easter. It's like you ask somebody that doesn't go to church any other time, say, are you going to church on Easter? They're like, of course I'm going to church on Easter. Like, what else would I be doing? Why would you ask such a crazy question? Of course. And you ask some ladies, and she says, I've already got my Easter dress. Of course I'm going to church. You can get them to come to church just so they can buy new clothes to come to church. 
Easter is going to be incredible this year at Cultivate. We're going to start off on Friday night with a Good Friday worship experience. Listen, people showed up last year on Good Friday that I had never seen before in my life. Why? Because they were going to be in church on Easter weekend. They just showed up because it's what they do. And they came into church, and you know what? They were loved on. They heard about Jesus. They were served. They were, they were given to. They weren't asked anything from. And we're going to do it again this year. And then on Saturday, we're going to have the helicopter egg drop. Of the two years that we did it, we had over 6,000 people every Every year from this city show up and you know what it didn't cost them to get in the gate it didn't cost them for a hot dog it didn't cost them for a bottle of water why because we're a generous church who loves their city and wants to give something away we want to say we don't expect anything from you we're not trying to raise money we're not having a bake sale we're not trying to get anything to pay this back we're going to give this to you because God has given us the love and we just want to love on you and show you the goodness of God and then on that Sunday morning, we're going to have three worship experiences beginning. And we're going to have more room for people to come in so you don't have to sit by people you don't like. Come on. And so you got chances and opportunities to come. And then when somebody says, well, I can't come at, at 11 o'clock, that's too late. You say, well, you know what? Why don't you come at 9 o'clock with me? Or, hey, why don't you come at 10, 15? Or, There's no excuses. We've got something for every person. Why? Because people matter. And because we have an opportunity. Let's take advantage of the right moment. And then number three is you got to have the right message. The right manner at the right moment with the right message. And you say, well, what's the message? I'm not, a, I'm not a speaker. I'm not a preacher. I'm not a teacher. How do I do this? Listen to what the Bible says. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So answer this question to yourself. Maybe spend some time on it this week. What has God done for you? Why do you, why do you believe? Why have you committed your life to Christ? Not just because it's the thing to do, or not just because a, a pastor told you to, or not just because you go to church, or maybe your parents did, but why have you given your heart to God? What has He done for you? And when you begin to answer that question, that's all anybody cares about. When you meet the people at your work and they're going through a tough time, they don't care how many scriptures you've memorized. They don't care what's happening at your church. They care about what God's done in you. Because if God will do it for you, he'll do it for them. And if God will do it for you, he'll do it for me. Because the Bible says he's no respecter of persons. Your story is the greatest thing you could ever share to impact the life of somebody else. I don't say it because I have to. I say it because I get to. Because God has changed my life and he's done so much for me. And I've got so much to share. The truth is, sometimes I'm too selfish and I don't. But I want God to grip my heart so much that I'm ready at any moment that I know that tomorrow God could call on me in a second if he needs me to speak life into somebody else. So church, I'm saying... We've been given a great responsibility. Let's steward it well. Let's don't keep this thing quiet. Let's don't, let's don't be secretive of the love of God. Let's share it and give it away because eternity weighs in the balance. There's, a, there's an eternity in heaven and there's an eternity in hell. It's not a scare tactic. It's just the truth. And if we believe it, we'll do everything we can to point people to Jesus and eternity with him. So I want us to bow our heads this morning. And I want to pray for us. If you're our guest today, nothing funny or weird. We're not coming to get you or embarrass you. I just want to take a moment. I want to pray for us today. And I really want to pray over two things. Number one, you may be in this auditorium or watching by the internet, and you may be saying to yourself, all that sounds great, but I don't have a clue what you're talking about. I've never experienced the love of God. I've never accepted Jesus into my life, so I don't know how to give that away. Well, let me take the pressure off this morning. Just the first thing you need to do is just come to a decision where you want to make Jesus number one because he'll change your life forever. And it doesn't matter how you walked in this place. It doesn't matter what's going on. It just simply means that you realize that you've done life your own way and it's not working and you need Jesus. And then I want to pray for the rest of us in here this morning that Maybe God would just begin to convict all of our hearts that we want to be the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus to the people who are around us. 
So if you're here this morning, and you just said, hey, I want to give my heart to Jesus. Listen, I told you I wouldn't embarrass you, and I'd never dream of it. But if you're comfortable and you want me to know that I that you want to be included in this prayer, maybe you just want to throw your hand up at me and say, hey, pray for me. I, I want to give my heart to Jesus today. Just include me in this prayer. And I would say even greater than your hands raised would be on that Connect card that Pastor Brandon talked about earlier. Will you mark it on that card? Because this is not where it ends. It's just the beginning. And, and we want to help you learn to love God and live your life for Him. We'll send you a letter in the mail with some next steps and pray for you this week. But God, right now, for every person that's making that decision, in this auditorium, watching by the internet, God, I pray that today, just forgive us of our sins. We realize that Jesus is the way, He's the truth, and He's the life. And that Jesus gave His life so that I could have relationship with You, my Father. So Jesus, forgive us today. We commit our lives to You. And Jesus, I pray for all of us who carry the name of Christ, that we would be the hands and the feet. That we would be the ones to take every opportunity to let people know that there's hope for their lives and that you love them and that you care for them. Today, Jesus, give us a greater desire to give our lives away for you and to live our life on purpose. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church. Lives have been changed all day. Can we celebrate God for that today?